Welcome uh, and good afternoon, everyone, to our forum on critical perspectives on the U.S.-backed Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement. I'm Nader Hashemi. I teach Middle East and Islamic politics here at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. We're very happy to be hosting this event today, which is co-sponsored by the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, um, Democracy in the Arab World Now, Center for International Policy, and the Forum on Arms Trade. Several months ago, it was reported that the Biden administration was investing considerable time, energy, effort, and political capital in expanding the scope of the 2020 Abraham Accords, which you'll all recall were a series of normalization agreements between Israel and several Arab dictatorships. And the plan now is to expand that deal to include Saudi Arabia. This new mega deal is being presented as a major historical event that might finally bring peace to the Middle East, securing American interests in the region, promoting economic prosperity for the people of the region, and advancing the prospects for a more stable Middle East going forward. Quote, a giant leap for the region that could change the Middle East forever, observed Benjamin Netanyahu, the biggest historical deal since the Cold War, according to Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Secretary of State Blinken said that normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel would be, quote, a transformative event in the Middle East and well beyond the region. And Thomas Friedman, writing in the New York Times, observed that, quote, this would be a game changer for the Middle East, bigger than Camp David, bigger than the Camp David peace treaty, between Egypt and Israel because peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia, the custodian of Islam's two holiest places, would open the way for peace between Israel and the whole Muslim world. So given these huge, the huge investment that the Biden administration has placed and put into securing this deal, and given the promises that have been made, and also given the vast amount of media coverage this topic has generated, we thought it was um, very appropriate for us to organize a panel discussion on this topic to interrogate it from a critical perspective. I'm anticipating, given how big this theme is in terms of U.S. Middle East policy, this is going to be the first of several events that we plan on organizing around this particular topic. So please stay in touch with us if you want more information about future events. Now, moderating today's panel discussion is Nancy O'Kale. She's president and CEO of the Center for International Policy. She's a scholar, a policy analyst, and an advocate with more than 20 years of experience working on issues of human rights, democracy, and security in the Middle East and North Africa. Joining her on the stage uh, today to help us analyze this topic is, uh, is Abdallah al Oda, a prominent Saudi dissident. He's the Saudi director for, for the Freedom Initiative and secretary general of the National Assembly Party in Saudi Arabia, a pro-democracy Saudi dissident party. Sarah Leah Whitson is the executive director of Dawn, Democracy in the Arab World Now, um, an organization set up by the late Jamal Khashoggi, and she was formerly director of uh, Human Rights Watch Middle East and North Africa Division. And Dylan Williams is vice president for government affairs at the Center for International Policy. He's a former U.S. Senate staffer, a lawyer, and previously he worked with J Street here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're being live streamed. Um, and we hope to have questions from people who are watching us um, via the internet. We're also hoping to have questions um, from people here on the, uh, who are physically present here. Um, but to moderate um, the second part of the program, or the, the main part of the program, before we get to question and answers, is Nancy O'Kale. Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. And uh, thank you so much, Nader, for um, the hosting us and for our second collaboration in just a, a few weeks. Um, I am very grateful to be able to host this event today with Dawn, I mean, and, and grateful for Sarah Lee, the executive director of Dawn being here, and also for Jeff Everson, the director of the Forum on Arms Trade. Um, as I said, I'm really grateful that we are able to discuss this issue today, not just for its importance or because it is one of the closest topics I work on on the region I come from. But I think it's also a great opportunity to deconstruct a lot of false assumptions about foreign policy. 
Um, CIP has been around for 50 years, uh, advancing uh, progressive foreign policy, and more often than not, people focus on the second part is like, what is progressive foreign policy? And I can't help put it better and clearer and simpler than my colleague, Matt Dust, the executive vice president of CIP this morning at the National Journal interview, basically saying it's the promotion of security, uh, prosperity, and freedom for all. But the difference of the progressive part is solidarity and, pros and prosperity for communities around the world. And that's the difference. And you wouldn't find a lot of people arguing against that. Who would argue against, I mean, standing by communities around the world and justice? It is just principle, but not pragmatic. That is what we always get, that it is a great value, but it's impractical. And it is not really uh, suitable for the grand strategic national interest in security and the interest of the United States. So actually, this new pact that we are discussing is an opportunity to really question, is it really delivering that assumption of such way of connecting with leaders around the world, no matter how they are leading their countries, whether they are dictators or not, uh, whether they're launching wars or not, uh, and if that is really delivering on the interest of the people of the United States. And for that, I want to turn to Sara Lee. Uh, and ask you, just like, how, how do you see this pact, particularly, well, yesterday we celebrated or commemorated five years since um, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, and thank you for hosting this great event. But things have changed drastically since then. Five years ago, uh, um, everyone was criticizing uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and then he was called a pariah. And now he is an ally, and we are just discussing a serious and controversial pact with them. Uh, so giving you yeah. the opportunity to talk about that. Um, I think the way that I uh, analyze the Biden administration's wholehearted um, um, prioritization of the Abraham Accords, um, that now comes part and parcel with very... Uh, um, strengthen ties with Saudi Arabia um, is by seeing that the Biden administration is um, really just faced with the incentives to always do the wrong thing. The Biden administration is not the first one that came in promising to withdraw from the Middle East, which really just means reducing our military engagements in the region and reducing our political uh, and military support for abusive regimes. He was explicit in saying he was going to recalibrate, he was going to sanction Saudi Arabia, end arms sales, uh, but not just Saudi Arabia, uh, end blank checks to dictators. Uh, and I think genuinely the Biden administration started with a desire uh, to reduce its footprint in the Middle East and quote unquote pivot to Asia, pivot to China. Uh, focusing uh, on uh, the global existential crisis uh, uh, of democracy versus authoritarianism. Um, there was an initial reduction of some Patriot missiles in Saudi Arabia, an additional, uh, uh, obviously, the major step of ending the war in Afghanistan. Um, but the blowback uh, was uh, uh, quite severe and harsh. Um, and I think that basically the Biden administration calculated um, that securing cheap oil, because one of the blowbacks was a, an increase in the price of oil, a refusal by Saudi Arabia to increase oil output. Uh, it wanted to prioritize continued arms sales because Saudi Arabia is the uh, biggest arms purchaser uh, of the United States and, and the world. Um, and the moves by Saudi Arabia to show that it would purchase arms from China, build a nuclear plant initially, uh, the plan was to do that with China, build a missile factory with China, um, made um, uh, President Biden recalibrate. 
Um, and at the same time, you now had Israel seeing that its interest was tied to closer ties uh, with the dictatorships of the region, Saudi, the UAE, of course, Egypt uh, and Jordan already uh, closely tied to. So you also had um, the pro-Israel lobbies in the United States strongly advocating for Biden uh, to renew its commitments to Saudi Arabia, to expand its commitments to Saudi Arabia for the interests of Israel, for a new bloc that they are seeking to establish, at first more secretly, but now more openly, um, that would serve as an anti-Iran bloc, um, but more significantly uh, reestablish and secure US primacy and hegemony in the region. Um, uh, Jake Sullivan, in a speech to the Washington Institute, laid out his vision for Middle East policy which he interestingly characterized as one really uh, uh, a resigned uh, 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 recognition that we can't uh, uh, force democracy in the region and we uh, need to secure uh, affordable uh, fossil fuels. Um, and so really uh, one of humility that we are accepting that these dictatorships are the source of stability and therefore, we are prioritizing uh, this unprecedented security guarantee uh, for Saudi Arabia and putting our eggs in the basket of a dictatorial authoritarian apartheid bloc. Um, I see this, in fact, as a reflection of generations of hubris and arrogance by the United States to prioritize above all else the notion that it should be the hegemon in the region. It should be uh, the actor that dictates the political affairs of the region, that orchestrates political outcomes like pieces on a chessboard, um, with the only cost factors being, uh, does this make us stronger vis-a-vis -vis China so that we are the ones pumping arms and weapons and now potentially nuclear plants in the region? We are the ones that have the closest ties to the dictatorships in the region. Uh, and a zero ability to factor in the costs to the United States uh, of uh, uh, such a role in the region, and specifically the costs of paying for Israel to normalize with Saudi Arabia with the security guarantee that will pull the lives of American men and women to secure the survival of a brutal, violent, uh, monarchical dictatorship uh, in the Middle East. I think it's a very short-sighted uh, approach. I think it's a politicized transactional approach, um, but I think it's one that fails to factor in uh, the global credibility cost to the United States, its inability to actually score points in the existential global fight for democracy versus authoritarianism, and actually will not work uh, to reduce uh, Saudi Arabia's or the UAE's closer ties, not just to China, but to Russia. And I think what we all have to grapple with is there is a new multipolar reality, and the United States needs to figure out how it's going to position itself, not just in the Middle East, but around the world. Does it want to be a race to the bottom to see who can sell the most weapons, who can offer the most effectively mercenary forces to protect dictatorships? Um, or is it going to find a more positive, constructive way uh, to project its role in the world? And also the question is like, even those who sell the most weapons, is this a guarantee for national security and the interest of the United States? I mean, just like, and I wanna come back to this, but I wanna to turn to Abdullah because this uh, deal is being framed and sugar-coated in a way that this is about normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And I want to get your take on that, to what extent this is accurate, and also how it is being perceived in the region, and particularly in Saudi Arabia, and, and also the implications of that in the dynamics within Saudi Arabia and relationships in the region. Thank you, Nancy. So, um First of all, uh, when we criticize the normalization, we always get this question is like, are you guys against peace? Which is like funny. It's like, uh, first of all, uh, this normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel is not ending any war that I know of. Uh, for, like, secondly, 
we are only arming and uh, protecting and emboldening uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who actually waged the most disastrous war in the region, uh, in Yemen, created the worst humanitarian crisis, blocaded a neighboring country, uh, cut relationship with Canada over a tweet, uh, did all of these atrocities because uh, he felt emboldened and protected by the West, and uh, uh, namely the US. So with this deal, we only embolden in uh, Mohammed bin Salman and the dictator in Riyadh uh, even more, and given him a free pass to do more of the policy that he, uh, I think, led to this um, position with uh, uh, Washington that allowed him to basically have this leverage to basically uh, dictate the terms of the relationship between the US and Saudi Arabia. So this is, I think, number one in the issue. Uh, secondly, when we talk about like normalization, we're actually not addressing the critical issue here, which is the relationship between two people. We're talking about like a dictator in Riyadh, an autocrat in uh, Tel Aviv, um, both very unpopular with uh, a huge legitimacy, legitimacy crisis in both countries. And they want to secure this deal in order to uh, have their power unchecked. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, because I'm Saudi, I, I, I think uh, for Mohammed bin Salman, this deal, uh, it, it's, it's a part of a deal to, um, like when he, when Biden came to power, he had this idea in his mind, normalization for normalization. So he wanted to do this normalization with Israel in order to be normalized in the international stage. And I think the Biden administration is actually ready to do this uh, at the expense of uh, what Sally mentioned, a lot of the promises, uh, a lot of the uh, positive uh, good starts when uh, Biden came to power. Um, and, and at the expense, uh, more importantly, I think in, in, in my perspective, at the expense of the Saudi people, of the interests of the Saudi people. When you talk about like normalization of Saudi Arabia, I, I, to be honest, I get, ner I, I get nervous, I get um, outraged. It's like, this is not Saudi Arabia. This is a relationship between one dictator, one man in Riyadh, uh, who is not institutionalized, who, who is not representative of the Saudi people, who is not elected, who is not popular at all, despite all what the you know, West press uh, can tell you, uh, he's not uh, you know, popular at all. I mean, if you ask, of course, if you ask, um, I don't want to name names, but if you ask some journalists who go to Riyadh more regularly and ask them about Mohammed bin Salman, they would say, oh, he's very popular. People go to the street to celebrate you know, things and you know, concerts and which is like, uh, uh, of course, we, we, we always uh, all celebrate uh, events uh, in Riyadh, like concerts and all. But the issue is like, this celebration is not representative of the popularity of Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman banned uh, public polling for a reason. He is not allowing elections for a reason. Uh, he is not allowing even uh, uh, basic surveys for a reason. I know people who actually were arrested in Riyadh because they did some polling on the street about issues including uh, relationship to Israel. So uh, when you do this at the expense of the people, you make the people even hate this even more. This is not a long-term relationship. This is not a deal. This is not a peace deal. Uh, this is not even a normalization between two people. If you talk about like normalizing Mohammed bin Salman in the international stage, yes. If you're talking about spilling bloods, uh, including Americans, uh, uh, to protect Mohammed bin Salman and his uh, you know, uh, small group, yes, that's the deal. Because part of the security pact is actually to um, uh, protect the dictator in Riyadh and his regime. So again, uh, a lot of times people think about like, oh yeah, protecting Saudi Arabia. This is not even protecting Saudi Arabia. I am a Saudi and I think my family, my loved ones, the people I care about, and the vast majority of Saudi Arabia are actually more risk with these kind of deals uh, because you are protecting the one who actually is torturing us on a daily basis, killing our uh, family ones, displacing 
uh, cities. And just like one example, a quick example, in the city of Jeddah, just uh, like do a quick uh, googling of this, uh, a third of the city, it's the second largest city in Saudi Arabia. It's called Jeddah. It's actually where actually Mohammed bin Salman met uh, Biden during the uh, infamous fist bump. Uh, Jeddah is populated by 4.7 million people. 1.4 million of this, uh, the people in the city uh, is being displaced right now. Most of them actually are already being uh, already displaced uh, while uh, I speak. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a message and a signal to Mohammed bin Salman that we do not care about the people you torture, you kill, you arrest, and we only care about the, the oil well, because at, the, at this moment, you, you control this. Thank you. Um, before I go to Dylan to discuss like the Israeli side of it, I, I just want to ask you like a quick follow-up question related to I mean, how you frame the issue. Does Mohammed Salman really need this fact to normalize with Israel? I think like, if you talk about Saudi Arabia, absolutely they do not need that. But for Mohammed bin Salman himself, he thinks in order to uh, normalize himself in the international stage, and let me put it this way, and maybe this is not, uh, it's not going to be uh, so popular, but I think Mohammed bin Salman has this implication in his mind, like this anti-Semitic even implication in his mind, that in order to have the power in Washington, you would go through, uh, through uh, Israel, and you would go through this normalization, because he failed. Uh, he knows that um, you know, his people are not going to defend him. He uh, even tested the Saudi army in Yemen, and they miserably failed against like, uh, the militias of Houthi, like militias, not even an army. So he knows he's not going to be protected by the Saudi army. There are people actually defecting from Saudi army. Uh, you can see them uh, in, in, in the UK and elsewhere. You see people defecting from police because of his policies. And but by the way, because of uh, the normalization, because they think this is being done at the expense of people's interests, at the expense of uh, people's protection, it's, I mean, when you protect a dictator who kills and tortures, you actually are giving him a free pass to kill even more and torture even more. So I think, yeah, to your question, um, Mohammed bin Salman himself, as a person, thinks he needs it in order to have this uh, normalization in the international stage. Thank you. We'll come back to that. And I want to come to you, Dylan. You've dedicated most of your life to promote dem diplomacy. And certainly, it's not the first time to be met with the overwhelming militarized approach to foreign policy. But I want to get your take on how this is playing out in Israel and, and also in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and particularly on what is new there uh, in this particular deal. Absolutely. So uh, thanks so much, Nancy, and thanks to Nader and the Wall School. And it's a real pleasure to be on uh, the panel with uh, uh, my fellow panelists here, and, and thanks to, uh, to Nancy who invited me to do this even before I had the pleasure of joining her at Center for International Policy. I mean, we're looking at the obvious demerits of these side deals and concessions that my colleagues here have described. And we should take a step back and realize that for the vast majority of members of Congress who will be reviewing at least some aspect of any package that is negotiated for American voters who follow foreign policy, the idea of normalization in and of itself is a good thing. It is a good thing when countries establish diplomatic relations. I, I, I think it was exactly right to say, you know, normalization for normalization would be one thing, you know, and we should actually question why isn't normalization for normalization good enough for either Saudi Arabia or Israel? Because if those who are coming at us, and we saw some pearl clutching in the run up to this very panel uh, on social media and other places, you know, clutching their pearls and saying, well, how can you possibly be against diplomacy and, and closer relations? The, the answer back to them is, well, if those things are good and we agree they are, why is what you're doing actually trying to sell these side deals and these concessions that don't have anything directly to do with whether these two peoples and their, uh, you know, the lack of an official uh, diplomatic channel and recognition of one another. What we repeatedly hear the administration say, as you noted, uh, is that uh, this 
will be transformative. And they are trying so hard, the administration is trying so hard to cram what is really a package of uh, different types of arms agreements, a nuclear agreement, which I'll describe a little bit more in, in a moment, uh, and some other things into the rubric of normalization because that makes it more palatable to a wider audience uh, of people. But let's actually look at what, not just the US interest uh, uh, that Sarah went through so well, but let's look at what the actual interests are to the region and to Israel as well because one thing is for sure is that members of Congress, when they are called upon to in some way review some aspect or many aspects of a mega deal are going to be looking at this through a lens of pro-Israel politics as it plays out uh, in the United States. And this is what the administration wants, and this is what the right-leaning side of the pro-Israel community wants as well. But if you take, take an actual look at Israeli interests, it is, by and large, not in Israel's interests for many of these elements of these side deals and concessions to go through. I can't believe this has to be said out loud, but I'll do it anyway. It is not in Israel's interest for Saudi Arabia to have an advanced nuclear program. And it is certainly not in Israel's interest for it to have one that does not meet current best practices for non-proliferation. But that is what our own administration is going towards in meeting Saudi Arabia's demand for a nuclear uh, domestic enrichment capacity uh, that does not meet the current gold standards of the additional protocol and other non-proliferation measures. Now, we see stories in the press that Benjamin Netanyahu and his government doesn't really care about the, the nuclear issue. They're willing to uh, uh, concede on that uh, for the other benefits that they associate with this, this forming mega deal. But let me tell you who, do, who does care about this. The Israeli security establishment cares. For those of you who remember the period of 2013, 2015, the real fight over the Iran deal, you'll remember that there was not one Israeli position. There was a split. There was the Israeli government's position, the Israeli political position on the one hand, and then there was the Israeli security establishment uh, on the other. And I spent those years taking around numerous former Israeli generals, heads of Mossad, you know, people who were really telling members of Congress what our government, what our prime minister is saying on this doesn't actually reflect what most Israelis who have defended Israel's security with their life think about it. And that we are seeing playing out here as well. So there's definitely a split between what the Israeli government, uh, how the Israeli government views some of these side deals and concessions and how the Israeli security establishment views them. Honestly, it's a potentially even bigger split than on the Iran deal because this time you actually have opposition politicians citing against uh, the official government position, at least up till this point when it comes to the nuclear issue. Uh, and we are starting to see members of Congress, just as they have before, express disagreement with where things are headed. You have a letter from 20 senators uh, that came out yesterday addressed directly to the president, led by Senators Chris Murphy, Chris Van Hollen, Peter Welch, uh, Dick Durbin, who is the number two ranking Democrat in the Senate, um, flagging that there is real concern in uh, U.S. Congress about giving Saudi Arabia a poorly monitored nuclear program. Um, this concern goes just beyond that nuclear issue. It is also extends to what I regard, because of the work I've done over the past 14 years, as really the elephant in the room, and that is the Palestinian issue. Just look uh, at what happened this week. The former head of the IDF civil administration in the West Bank, Ephraim Sine, wrote a piece lamenting the way normalization is heading and lamenting a normalization deal that facilitates Saudi uranium enrichment but includes no steps irreversibly advancing Palestinian statehood. He wrote, Mohammed bin Salman has no problem attempting to satisfy the Palestinian Authority with money and words, neither does Netanyahu, the money is not his and his attitude towards verbal promises is well known. Here you have an ex-Israeli soldier, the guy who is literally in charge of the occupation, by far, you know, not someone who's like siding with the, the left or the progressives very often on things. And he is saying it is hurting Israel's security to be leaving the Palestinians out of, it, out of this, to be ignoring the Palestinian issue. And despite the Biden administration providing some lip service to preserving the prospects for a two-state solution, this deal does seem headed to a merely cosmetic treatment of the Palestinian issue. 
that harms Palestinians in ways uh, that other people are much better uh, to describe based on their lived experience. Uh, I'll note that it is also a major blow to those in Israel and its supporters around the world who understand that Palestinian statehood is vital to Israel's future as the democratic homeland of the Jewish people and the state of all its citizens. That's why it, the Palestinian issue is also mentioned in this letter from 20 United States senators and was endorsed just this morning by Commanders for Israel's Security, a group of over 500 uh, former top Israeli commanders from intelligence, military, police, et cetera, uh, expressing their concern as well. And I'll just finish up by saying, before anyone accuses me of saying uh, Arab and Muslim majority states should hold out for full end of conflict uh, between Israel's, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians before normalization, let me not only reject that notion, but do you one better. If normalization with Israel prior to resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a good thing for those historically supporting the Palestinians to do, why isn't normalization with the state of Palestine prior to conflict resolution for those who have historically supported Israel? Why is there a double standard? You want to do a mega deal that resolves as many issues as possible and serves as many interests as possible? Why isn't the United States already in the middle of this putting on the table our own recognition of Palestinian statehood? Why is what's good for Israel not good for Palestine? And let's finally get Palestine recognized as a state in the community of nations. Amen. Um, Dylan, thank you so much for those illuminating uh, remarks. And uh, I re realize even more why we're so lucky to have you. <laughs> um, I'm sure a lot of people will have questions. But um, Sarah, there is a common theme between what Abdullah said and what Dylan said about discrepancy between what the government want and the, the security establishment want, and for Abdullah, the Saudi people and Mohammed bin Salman as a person, not as a government. And that's not strange for me, someone coming from the Middle East, this is our tradition. Uh, but what surprises me is to see uh, some indications of that in the United States, particularly reflected in how we are all left speculating about what this deal is really about. There is some opacity there. Uh, we talk about this a lot, trying to get more information. And a question is like, why is this the case? Yes, there is national security concerns, but there are other issues that there would be nothing wrong with being transparent about it. And from my perspective, I read this as legitimacy concern. And I don't know how you see this uh, and why this is happening. Um, I think you're absolutely right in, in describing the very autocratic way that the Biden administration, like the Trump administration before it, went around promoting uh, Israeli normalization uh, in the Arab world and paying the price for it. Um, Obviously, I'm sure many of you may agree, the foreign policy in the United States is the least democratic of all the policies of the United States because there's no native constituency that will prioritize America's behavior and the rest of the world as their top issue. Um, but with this deal in particular, um, and I've been writing about this for over a year, the Biden administration has truly uh, been hiding uh, its uh, efforts to create this uh, security pact for Saudi Arabia, which is by far the most controversial aspect of their approach. Um, and uh, uh, initially last year, around fist bump time, um, when information about this pending security pact and uh, 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 an umbrella approach that would bring Israel under and you know, uh, combined with the security of uh, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, and Saudi Arabia was mentioned uh, by uh, Israelis, uh, by Emiratis, the US uh, wouldn't comment or, you know, it, with, with their sources were denying it. Um, but it was in the cooker. And I think the reason for that is um, because it's clear that the American people do not want the United States to provide a security guarantee 
probably to just about anywhere at this point, even the uh, American uh, bottomless pit of billions going to Ukraine uh, has now brought down uh, Speaker McCarthy. Um, and imagine, however, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, um, Americans do not want this kind of a security pact. Um, and I think the Biden administration is betting that if it could package it as a peace deal, it will make the security pact part of it more palatable. Um, I know that this is being portrayed, the security pact, as something the US has to give uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in order to persuade them to normalize with Israel, which of course begs the question of why doesn't Israel pay for its normalization? Um, why did the United States have to pay off Morocco by recognizing the illegal occupation of Western Sahara? Why did the United States have to pay off uh, the junta in uh, Sudan, taking them off the terror list and uh, basically erasing a $300 million debt they had? Um, why did the United States have to bribe the Emiratis with the most advanced fighter jets? Why is the United States paying for the bill uh, of something that is in the interests of Israel uh, and potentially the interests of these autocrats, um, particularly when U.S. support for this is questionable and U.S. interests, U.S. gains, U.S. benefits uh, are largely absent? Um, and again, I think I turn back to the power and influence of uh, uh, these foreign governments, uh, as well as uh, domestic lobbies, particularly the military, uh, the uh, defense industry, um, that are able to reward the Biden administration so handsomely uh, to promise them payoffs, uh, short-sighted payoffs, sufficient that they are willing to not only enter into, into a transaction that uh, serves no visible benefit to the American people, uh, potentially endangers the American people, um, but is not even likely to secure what they're hoping for, which is cheaper oil and more weapon sales, you know, neither of which is necessarily actually in the interests of the American people, the environment, our stated goals and interests. Um, and I do believe that both Republican and Democratic administrations have become captive to these lobbying uh, uh, influence uh, efforts and that we are seeing a level of foreign government infiltration, not just in our economy, not just in our cultural institutions, not just in art, fashion, music, film, banking, finance, tech, all of the areas that Saudi Arabia is massively investing in and control and, and acquiring very important uh, stakes in, in some cases total control like PGA Tour, it is in the process of acquiring our elected officials. When 500 former military officials are now on the payroll of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, when former American officials uh, get $2 billion and $1 billion payouts the day after they leave office for services well rendered. Uh, and there's so much punishment should they try to uh, not deliver what these foreign governments want and what the defense industry wants. It unfortunately uh, creates very serious conflict of interests that our laws fail to address. Um, there is no law that prohibits uh, an American uh, general uh, or, or the head of the American National Security Council from leaving the day after they leave office and working for a foreign dictatorship. And that's the choice that hundreds of Americans have made. And I think that influences the decision making of people sitting in the Biden administration today. And I can't look them in the eye and say I trust them to make decisions in the American people unless they first pledge that they will never do business with, work with, or work for a foreign government or a defense industry company. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, one of the things we try to push ourselves on at CIP is beyond criticizing bad policies and dangerous policies, is to push ourselves to ask, so what is the alternative? And, and I wanna ask this question, and I find myself when I'm asking this question, and I wanna go to you first, Abdullah, is like, when you say what's the alternative, you are somehow implicitly um, confirming that what is happening is necessary. And 
We just don't like the way we're going about it and we need an alternative. Um, and Abdullah, I wanna ask you is just like, is this necessary? And if it is, what is the alternative of all the things that we have criticized over the past 45 minutes? I would say um, something simple, like uh, we talked about like why this is not, for example, in the case of Saudi Arabia, being institutionalized. This is not uh, a decision of institutions or a, a reflection of the Saudi people. I think the simple alternative to this is to have institutions, it is to have institutions that are uh, uh, reflective of the Saudi will, of the Saudi people, something deeper when they make a decision it's it's a long term it's a it's a decision by the people it's not because of a legitimate legitimate legitimacy crisis of a one man who um, fails to address the real issues and uh, he rather just wanted to uh, make a deal to protect himself at the expense of everything else so for example um, uh, uh, this year we, uh, for in, the, in the Saudi opposition, uh, presented something that we called the people's vision, in which we address many issues, including the need for diplomacy uh, 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 instead of war, the need for, uh, uh, you know, a relationship, a normal relationship with people. But in order for this to happen, this has to come uh, uh, at the right place from the right people uh, and uh, from institutions uh, when they are elected, when they are uh, reflective of the will of the people, when there are free speech, uh, freedom of expression and uh, uh, free press. And um, because we lack any of these things in Saudi Arabia, the, uh, uh, the current relationship, even like the protection of Saudi Arabia by the US is basically uh, uh, is coming at the expense of all the above. Thank you. Dylan? What would we do differently? Well, look, I think the most important thing that can be done as an alternative is to actually regionalize this process of a mega deal. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, why is it incumbent on the United States to provide all these goodies? At the end of the day, this really does seem like a contrived process to pull the United States back in uh, even deeper than before with an even larger financial commitment and maybe even ultimately commitment of our, our men and women in uniform uh, into this region. Why not regionalize it? Why not have a truly multilateral process in which what some people would call the great powers are not necessarily drivers, but are merely consultants or observers, and instead have a table that is actually set with the folks in the region talking it out, and critically important to that is bringing in the Palestinians so that they are not left out. The Palestinians, through the entire Abraham Accords process, have been, if at all, an afterthought. You know, in, invited to take part in like some forum here or there that after the, the deal is all done. That is not the way it should be. This should be a truly regionalized process. And by the way, for details of that process, you can read a piece that was written by Jake Sullivan and Daniel Benayim before they were actually in office this time around, which lays out very concisely the argument for why the United States can actually accomplish what it says it needs to vis-a-vis -vis preventing Russia or China from, in their view, gaining too much influence in the region through a more regionalized, truly diplomatic, multilateral process. Uh, and so I think totally stepping back from this you know, unrelenting, American-driven process to before our election season begins in earnest, hammer out a deal that is going to change the face of this region uh, in many ways that if what we're seeing as reported are the terms will not be for the best, uh, step away from that, you know, uh, rush to the finish line and instead engage a process that's actually going to better accomplish U.S. interests and accomplish uh, uh, much more for the actual people in the region. Thank you so Maybe much. Quick, quick thing also. Yeah, sure. Uh, Please go ahead. So uh, when Mohammed Musaman did this interview with Fox News and uh, days before that when he speaks uh, to uh, Saudi people, uh, he always mentioned that the deal... Um, 
will not be de done uh, until uh, the Palestinians are satisfied. And then he talked about like, uh, the need to solve the Palestinian issue before uh, this normalization deal is going to be approved by Saudi Arabia and before Saudi Arabia embark on this project of normalization with Israel. Uh, like two days later, when Netanyahu did the interview with Fox and CNN, he said the Palestinian issue was never mentioned and it's actually not uh, like a real issue by the Saudis. They only use this for, and, and Netanyahu was very blunt actually. He said. They use they use this um, uh, for like media purposes and, and all. So even the Saudi side is not even serious about like uh, including the the Palestinians in the process. Thank you, Abdullah. I I have tons of follow up questions, but I want to give the audience to ask their questions. Uh, and I also want to note that we are taking questions over Zoom as well. Uh, so please go ahead and, and share your questions. Uh, please introduce yourself and ask a question. <laughs> uh, so please go ahead. Hi, folks. Thanks for the panel. Uh, John Ramming Chappelle, Center for Civilians in Conflict. And my question is, Dylan, you brought up the uh, letter led by Senators Murphy, Van Hollen, uh, Welch, and Durbin. I'm curious, uh, how does Congress fit into this picture? What's next for skeptics of these side deals in Congress now that the letter's out? Thank you. Great, so uh, thanks for that question. So how does Congress fit into this picture? Let's, let's go from the most technical to the, to the least. Uh, you know, the three components of this are the normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel, the nuclear agreement between the United States and Saudi Arabia, um, and then the defense agreement between the United States and, and Saudi Arabia. Starting with the defense agreement, if it is an Article 5 NATO-like commitment, we're in treaty territory. And per the Constitution, this is something that does not go into effect until it is ratified. Uh, and so there you are talking about a major, at least in the Senate, a major actual fight. And there will be lobbies and interest groups uh, on both sides. And so that's when, why when 20 senators from the president's own party express concern about a uh, formal uh, uh, military agreement like that, it, you know, it, it causes some notice. I won't go into it here, but we can also take a look, there's a little deeper discussion to be had about what are the Republican senators' calculations and all this, and certainly they have competing interests and the, you know, the, the cut to the chase uh, position on this is, well, it matters what Donald Trump says about this deal uh, if there is a deal to be had. So we're talking about a very formal role for the Senate in the context of an actual US-Saudi uh, Arabia military uh, commitment that rises to the level of a treaty. Of course, the administration could negotiate something that is not at the treaty level. It's uh, at the executive agreement level. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that would meet Saudi Arabia's needs, uh, but there you don't then have the Congress automatically having to approve something. In terms of the nuclear component, due to longstanding uh, law on nuclear cooperation with other countries, there is a process for reviewing these types of agreements, and uh, Section 123 agreement. Um, it'll be interesting to see exactly what form this agreement takes and in particular what the, uh, the monitoring, inspection, and other non-proliferation measures are under it and whether Congress will deem that sufficient for it to allow it through, uh, to go into effect through the 123 process. By the way, one could envision members of Congress requiring or at least submitting legislation that would require extra procedure for one aspect of this deal or the entire package of deals. Look at what happened in uh, 20, I guess it was technically 2014, 2015, when the ANARA uh, bill became law, the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act. That established the, the threshold that a resolution of disapproval, uh, if it passed both chambers of Congress and somehow became law, uh, that would prevent the administration from implementing 
certain parts of the, or most of the, most of the deal. Um, it is conceivable that legislation like that could at least be suggested in this Congress, though maybe not necessarily passed given the dysfunction and, and partisan split uh, in Congress. Interestingly, the th thing that is least subject to review by Congress, but which will be most talked about by Congress, is the Saudi-Israel piece of this, which is the actual normalization agreement. And if you look at the actual Abraham Accords that have come before themselves, they're fairly short, fairly straightforward, don't contain any real concessions, uh, you know, either to the Palestinians or uh, contain the goodies that the United States gave Israel and other countries to secure those deals, which were all done in, I won't call them secret side deals, but in side deals, side agreements, and other instruments. Um, so there is, to answer your question in the shortest way possible, there's a range of potential congressional action and a lot of points where they could weigh in between now and implementation of a final uh, set of agreements. Thanks, David. Sarah, do you want to add anything, or Abdullah, to the point? Good. Other questions? Uh, my name is Roger Cochetti. I'm here as a Georgetown Foreign Service School alum. And uh, my question is, isn't the elephant in the room here China, particularly given the Saudi rapprochement, whatever the proper term is, with, with China recently, isn't there an argument floating around which says, okay, United States, if you don't want any of this, we don't need you. We'll get nuclear cooperation with China. We'll have blah, blah, blah. So uh, could any of the panelists talk about the China-Russia larger context of this, because I'm sure it's playing in every discussion around the world about it. Thank you. Very important question. Yeah, uh, Sarah. Um, I, this is a question that, that uh, comes up in many, many different contexts. Um, and I think that attempting to quote unquote win against China and Russia by maintaining a zone of influence and control in the Middle East, you know, kind of the last uh, sphere of pure American influence where everyone's on the American side, I think it's a lose-lose strategy. Um, it's an outdated strategy. Um, and frankly, I don't want the United States to win the contest with China of who can more weaponize the region, who can better support tyrants and autocrats and apartheid governments. I want to lose that fight. I don't want to win that fight. Um, that's one. Second of all, um, I don't think uh, that giving Saudi Arabia, quote unquote, this nuclear plant, which they have clearly said they will build with China if US doesn't, um, is going to keep China and Russia out of the Middle East. Uh, the, the, the Saudi government, the Emirati government, the Egyptian government, they have all made clear that they are hedging their bets and pursuing their own interests, including purchasing weapons and establishing closer economic ties um, with China. And the sooner we understand um, that we are going to continually have our leash yanked uh, by these dictatorships uh, on the basis of, well, we'll go to China if you don't, we are going to keep making dangerous uh, concessions that don't serve the interests of the American people. And that's why what I said at the beginning of this conversation is, so long as American policies are framed around where can we sell the most weapons, where can we have a leg up on China in terms of political control, where can we uh, have dictators on our side that will be pliant, and by the way, they never are, um, we're going to be stuck in a losing fight. I think the best way for the United States uh, to uh, uh, position itself as the most popular nation in the world, the most loved nation in the world, because I think that should be the contest, um, is by pivoting to the things that made America great in the first place. It wasn't global domination. It wasn't building of empires. It was building of ideas and values and showing how the American people prospered uh, under a democratic system uh, it was being a leader in technology and creativity, uh, in, in science, in education, in culture. Um, that is the contest that America can and should be trying to win. 
And perhaps it sounds fantastical um, to oldsters like you and me, but I hope the next generation will see within their grasp an ability to transition the United States away from late stage empire uh, war and guns and bodies competition, reducing America to a mercenary force around the world, uh, to recapturing uh, the good things that America uh, 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 can do around the world uh, and that we can all be proud of, everyone here and people abroad. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Abdullah, you uh, wanted to? Like two other points. Um, so one, um, we allow a lot of these dictators in the Middle East to use the China card. We empower them by allowing them to use the China card all the time. And they realize it works all the time. And, um, you know, the thing with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, for example, is that when he didn't get concessions enough from the Biden administration, he started this uh, uh, like uh, invitation to the Chinese uh, president and this relationship and, you know, uh, the, leaking the information about selling uh, oil uh, by yuan, the, the Chinese uh, currency, and all these things that, um, that will hurt the Saudi people, the Saudi institutions, the Saudi country, and hurt himself, and he knows that. Yes, he is stupid, but he understands these basic things. So he uses these things in, in order to get concessions, in order to, le to get leverage over the U.S. And uh, it works for him. We allow this to work for him. So that's number one. Number two, uh, yes, it will take decades for Saudi Arabia to um, change the whole infrastructure that was built by the U.S. to, uh, to Chinese or Russian. Uh, and that will take a lot of time, and MBS knows this. Um, but for someone like Mohammed bin Salman, he actually um, sees this relationship as a long-term strategic goal. Why? Because he thinks and he knows that, or at least that's what he assumes, uh, wrongly assumes, they think, that democratic countries like the U.S. will never like fully protect him. Will never. Uh, they will always be like Congress and like you know. It's, it's always headache to get a protection by these countries. So for him, if you think that, for example, pressure in him will make him pivot to China and Russia, you're dead wrong. I'll give you just a quick example. Like during the Biden administration, when uh, sorry during the Trump administration. When Trump offered to Mohammed bin Salman probably the, 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 uh, uh, the best protection that Mohammed bin Salman hoped for, especially during the Khashoggi event, and, Muhammad, uh, and uh, you know, Trump was so blunt in protecting Mohammed bin Salman and saying that, oh yeah, everybody in the world does this, and it's not just Mohammed bin Salman, it's like, no, no, let's go, let's, let's get over this. During this time, when Trump was completely protecting Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed bin Salman was building ballistic missile by the Chinese. You know, during the Trump, this, this should teach us a lesson that this is not about like when we protect the, you know, the dictator, he will not pivot to China or Russia. So I, I think one, it will take him many, many decades uh, two, and he knows this is not at the, the, it's not going to work for him very well, but also he's using this as a long-term strategy because he thinks to, to do what, what he does as an absolute uh, monarch and as an absolute ruler, he needs uh, you know, a country that protects him no matter what, that does not ask questions, that does not, does not tell him about like, human rights violations or wars or, you know, he wants the kind of, you know, uh, uh, treatment that Bashar al-Assad gets. So that's what, if, if that's what we dream of, then, you know, we are at a very, very sad situation. Thanks, Abdullah. Any other questions or questions from Zoom? You wanna go? Uh, from Zoom, uh, Kareem Trabulsi from the New Arab asks, will Saudi Arabia go ahead with a deal without the Palestinians? And if so, where would that leave rejectionist forces like Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran? Javon, 
Do you want to take this one? Sure. I mean, I'd be interested to hear what some of my colleagues think. I, it is hard to tell where MBS is on the question of how much he is going to be seen to ask for uh, concessions on the Palestinian front. You have, well, it seems almost every two days or so, you have a statement from MBS kind of minimizing in some way the Palestinian issue. And then you see a little bit of cleanup by some of you know, the foreign ministry folks uh, in Saudi Arabia saying, oh, no, no, this is actually you know, like quite, quite important. Um, look, if I had to guess, and I, I, I do have to guess, uh, you know, it, it's more towards what he himself tends to say in minimizing it. I mean, look at the you know, self-negotiating he's undergone. When you're talking about the Arab Peace Initiative, and I'm not going to get into the fight over whether this is a Jordanian or Saudi document and all that, it is a good starting point and has been from the beginning a good opening offer, not just from the Arab world, but Muslim-majority states as well, uh, to begin serious multilateral efforts toward uh, normalization with all of these countries and Israel. And what Mohammed bin Salman has done has taken all the equity in that document and trashed it and already said he's willing to normalize for something much less than that. Uh, so if you're willing to give up that much uh, right at the outset without even being pressed to do so, um, uh, you know, my sense as someone who used to do negotiations is you're, you're, that's not really an issue that's important to you when it actually comes to the negotiating table. Can I add to that? Um, uh, I think I start with the premise and the understanding that the two-state solution is dead, uh, and everyone knows that, and Oslo is dead, um, and that the focus of uh, everyone who wants peace and security in the Middle East uh, should be to end occupation and apartheid by Israel, um, regardless of what one block of Palestinians versus one block of Israelis say or do. Um, the problem is Israel's occupation and apartheid, and ending those things should be untethered to anything the Palestinians do or don't do. Um, I think that any concessions um, that uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, pretends to get from Israel will not be worth the paper they're written on, just like the concessions that the UAE supposedly got uh, from uh, Israel um, were garbage like the next day with fresh expanded settlements. Um, finally, uh, I would say that's what's worth even less uh, uh, is anything that the Palestinian leadership, the so-called Palestinian leadership of the Palestinian Authority, would agree to or concede to um, because they are a corrupt, illegitimate uh, body that does not represent the Palestinian people. Um, and uh, I assure you that the only quote-unquote concessions we'll see are handsome payoffs to the PA uh, and meaningless promises of you know, transfer of some uh, uh, useless land in Area C, depopulated years, land from one piece of occupation and occupied territory to another piece of occupied territory, if they even do that, which I don't think they will do. I think the best chance we have that this normalization facade uh, will be tanked is by the extremist Israeli government itself. They are so extremist, they will not even be able to bring themselves to make the, uh, what's the polite word for bullshit? The, 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 the <laughs> you know, the, the most bullshit promises to do things. They are so extreme, they won't even make those promises. Um, and honestly, I find it revolting um, that any of this transactional exchange between the apartheid government of Israel, dictatorship of Saudi Arabia, and the compromised American officials should be portrayed as having anything to do um, with Palestinians or Palestinian rights or human rights of anyone, Israelis or Palestinians. It's, it's really, I, I find it quite offensive. Thank you, sir, for calling things for what they are. Um, so I just want to give an opportunity for each one of you, if, if there were any final thoughts, and I want to start by Abdullah. No, maybe to, uh, to the question uh, being ju was just asked. Um, so I think Mohammed bin Salman um, will talk about the Palestinians as long as he thinks that he will get the uh, best deal for himself. Um, if 
he thinks that he needs it no more, he will definitely abandon it. And he shows that th this was the case even during the, um, the deal of the century. Uh, he told it to one friend of mine who spoke to me. Uh, so we, I have just one person between Mohammed Salman and me. Uh, this person told me, he said, I was sitting with him, we talked about the uh, deal of the century, and he said, oh, the Palestinians are so stupid. I offered them money, and I told them, look, this is just a one-time kind of chance, and they didn't like it, they, they rejected it. And he said it's like a huge, like, huge amount of money. Uh, so he thinks that maybe offering money this time also could work. Um, so he showed that in, in previous uh, instances that he is ready to completely abandon, I mean, from the Saudi side, Mohammed bin Salman abandoned completely the uh, Palestinian issue. Unless, and I think it's, it's uh, unless there is a pressure or, or, or he thinks that there's going to be, uh, the deal is going to be hugely unpopular to the degree that it will, you know, invite uh, a criticism among like people, which is like now he thinks uh, he's done with, uh, with all the oppression, all the tool, uh, shutting down all the public sphere and everything. He thinks that even unpopular uh, policies, uh, people cannot say anything about them. If he thinks that this is like a, an exception to the rule, meaning that can invite real, like, uh, uh, you know, criticisms, uh, he may at least try to, you know, incorporate like a small deal that he thinks Palestinian can accept. Other, other than that, I think he will definitely be ready to abandon the whole issue. Thanks, help Dada. Dylan, do you have any final thoughts you want to share? Well, uh, just that, you know, to return to something I kind of hinted at before, you know, I, I agree with uh, Sarah's assessment that one choke point on this is the extremist Israeli government. Uh, I, mean, I think that is probably one of the two greatest barriers to this actually um, uh, becoming a real done deal. I think the second is quite similar to that government uh, is Republicans here in the United States. And I say this as a former Republican Senate staffer, um, one can see a scenario where the Republican Party uh, you know, supports this deal because you have traditional pro-Israel forces uh, supporting it. Um, and you know, certainly we have already seen uh, some of that, um, but I think it does come down to Donald Trump and what, you know, he, how he ultimately talks about the deal whether as it's forming and as it, it, it may be done. On the one hand, you already have Jared Kushner leaning on him on behalf of the Saudi government to, you know, say this is a good thing and, and to support this. Uh, and if Trump and his family are well, well and truly bought by the Saudis and beholden to them financially, that might be where things go. But on the other hand, we've all seen how unpredictable Trump is, except for one thing, and that's his narcissism. And he could just deeply not want Joe Biden to get what Trump and his right-wing friends see as a win. He doesn't want Biden to outscore him. Uh, and so that in itself may be enough to kind of like the you know, extremists uh, in Israel uh, and the government there, uh, just reject this. Find some way to criticize it. It won't align with any of the ideas that we've shared here necessarily. Um, uh, but I think that's going to be quite decisive in whether uh, or not the Republicans uh, or a big chunk of the Republicans are going to go along with this. And that has real impacts when it comes to things like actually approving treaty level security guarantees, um, you know, not rejecting a nuclear cooperation agreement. Uh, and so I think that's the big unknown one of the big unknowns at this point. Thank you, Dylan. Um, well, at the beginning of this conversation, I, I said that the progressive foreign policy are always accused for being principled and not pragmatic. And I tried to set aside the principles and the values on the side and talk about the pragmatism. And I think it's very clear from everything that Abdullah Sarah and Dylan said is like how problematic such deal is and the dangerous implications, uh, not just for the people in the region, but also for the United States' its interests, which is something that we believe in. It's like there's no national security without global security. Uh, as Deder said at the beginning, this is only a start of a series of conversation that we are taking and, uh, and also 
work that we write and, uh, and analyze. So uh, please continue to follow this conversation and join me to thank uh, Sarah Abdullah and, and Dylan for this fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs>